Good afternoon, everyone. And um, we're just, I'm just watching on my screen as the number of participants is increasing by the second, uh, 26 and counting at the moment. Um, so we'll just give a little bit more time to, um, for everyone to uh, get, get, uh, get into the screen. Right, um, I think we're probably there now. Um, and so I'm going to uh, formally start the proceedings by welcoming everyone to our second formal POCA webinar of uh, 2021, uh, at least this time of year, um, and to the hot topic of international cooperation with EU member states now that we're, we're uh, in Brexit and no longer part of the EU. Um, I'd like to start first of all with perhaps the most important thing, which is to introduce to uh, to many of you. Uh, we've got the list of who's um, who signed up for this seminar. Many of you will have been to Five St Andrews Hills seminars before or webinars, as they more recently are. But you may not have met Barnaby Hone, who is our new recruit to the Proceeds of Crime team. Um, Barnaby has joined us um, with an enviable reputation. Um, he is a complete expert in the fields of proceeds of crime and asset recovery. Uh, he's recently appointed to the SFO A panel in POCA, so he's filling the place which um, I, by my appointment, have, I think, dropped out of. And um, it's very nice to uh, welcome him to Chambers. He's going to be a great asset, um, and we are very pleased to have him. Uh, what I'd like to do, first of all, just by way of introduction, is to tell all of you what you, I'm quite sure you already know, which is that we're going to be talking this afternoon about something called the TCA. The TCA is the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, uh, which, as we all know, was done in a great hurry immediately before midnight, or not quite, but around about Christmas, um, at the end of last year. What I just want to do, and what is going to happen is Tess is going to, going to drop her share screen, and I'm just going to share my screen with you now um, to tell you what the TCA looks like. Th this is it from the um, official journal. Uh, look at the date here, 30th of April 2021. Uh, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, as, as we all know, um, was promulgated on the, came into effect on New Year's Day or New Year's Eve of this year. At that stage, they had done it in such a hurry, they didn't give it sequential paragraph numbers. So what they've done since is to reissue it. Um, we think, I haven't spotted any changes, but the main change is it's actually got paragraph numbers. So we can actually talk about Article X for Article 237 or whatever. But please remember when we look at this trade and cooperation agreement, this is the international instrument which replaces our membership of the EU and regulates how we deal with them in all sorts of things. And only one narrow area of that is international cooperation um, in relation to pocket matters. The key thing is to remember that this is a bit of a back of an envelope job. And if you look up here, how many pages it is, it's on the back of 2,530 uh, envelopes. So as you look through it, it's pretty indigestible. Uh, when I introduce pupils to Proceeds of Crime Act, I usually say, and I know Barnaby does the same, go off and read the Proceeds of Crime Act. Um, and that's, that's a bit of a, an effort, but this is uh, like six Proceeds of Crime Acts in terms of volume. Um, so anyway, I'm going to stop showing that because we're, we're, we're deliberately not going to be taking you through word by word of that, at least till, till we get to the important bits. Um, if you wanted me to sum up what its effect is in terms of the um, uh, mutual cooperation, it's to replace what was mutual recognition beforehand with mutual cooperation, which is what we all understood we had to start off with. I, for one, uh, I won't reveal how I voted in the Brexit debate, but I felt personally really rather embarrassed going along to Southwark Crown Court and saying to a judge who'd carefully set aside time to consider an application under something called the Criminal Justice and Data Protection Regulations Protocol Number 36, um, 2014, um, to tell the judge that under these regulations, he really didn't have any decision making to do whatsoever because he was obliged to give mutual recognition 
to a judgment from this, I was about to say foreign court, but of course what I meant is court from one of our fellow Eastern Bloc, ex-Eastern Bloc members of the uh, uh, European Union. The, I don't think the judges liked it very much being told, um, please apply your rubber stamp, or rather you're required to apply your rubber stamp unless one of the following exceptions applies. And we're back to the good old days really of where the court uh, where is, is enjoined by the international regulations to give the fullest possible measure of assistance to our friends in uh, the former uh, or our, our former partners, but who are now our friends, as Boris Johnson might call them. But anyway, that's that's the difference, uh, really. We've moved from mutual recognition back to mutual cooperation. And first Gary and then Barnaby are going to tell you about it. So without any further ado, I think it's um, Barnaby who's going to be speaking to you first. And I'll let him prompt test with the change of slides and hand you over. So over to you, Barnaby. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you very much for the warm welcome. It's lovely to be part of the team at Five St Andrews Hill and such a, a team which um, has such a wide reputation in this area. I hope to talk about international cooperation and in the confiscation sphere. Gary's going to um, specialise in the non-conviction-based um, area of mutual, um, mutual cooperation. Now, so next slide, please, Tess. So what we're looking at is part two of POCA um, related cases, looking at effective restraint and effective enforcement, value-based orders, as you know. Now in the world which, where we have an increasingly um, more liquid economy, economies that assets can move much more quickly, as you will all know, and I'm very glad to have such an experienced audience here today, that is easy to move assets quickly and efficiently. So therefore, cooperation is key. My experience is particularly working with the CPS over in Jamaica and the Caribbean, seeing um, assets being moved through varieties of jurisdictions there and also um, to Europe. And that's where the international cooperation comes in, both in, in all areas of asset recovery both the recognition and enforcement of restraint and confiscation orders, but also the ability to request and obtain information about assets so that the um, evidential tracing can be more efficient. That's of course on top of the very established intelligence networks that are in place. Next slide, please, Tess. So let's look, what we're gonna do is look at the previous position and then look at the current position. Also look at um, international cooperation outside of our European partners, or ex-European partners, as Andrew put it so eloquently, and look at the difference between mutual recognition and mutual cooperation. I have to say I was all a fan of mutual recognition, partly because it, after writing the chapter for Millington and Southern Williams on it, I didn't really ever want to rewrite it but that has passed in the referendum. So looking at the framework decisions, I think we'll look at where the position is and that does have useful hints and useful um, contrast to the position we're in now. Also, as you'll see, that um, position is still in um, place for pre, um, for, um, reckon it, for sorry, requests, which took place before um, 2021, so before we broke formally with the EU. Now, we've got the framework decision 2003-577, framework uh, freezing of property for confiscation purposes. Second framework decision 2006-783, mutual recognition of confiscation orders. Then you have the criminal justice and data justice and data protection protocol 2014, which gave effect to the framework decision domestically allowed there to be that mutual recognition, as Andrew um, mentioned, and which formally put recognition, so a fait accompli for judges, unless there was one of the um, objections could be put in place, rather than having the mutual cooperation that had previously been in place and was in place outside of the EU. EU regulation then, 2018-1805 on mutual recognition of freezing orders and confiscation orders, it replaced the framework decisions 
and it's only in place for a matter of weeks. I'm not going to go into that in much detail. Next slide, please. So, the 2003 and 2006 fr um, framework decisions apply to both freezing orders and confiscation orders. They are now still in place, as I mentioned, for um, any request before December the 31st. And there was a flurry of, um, as you can imagine, requests going in before that date so that these provisions, provisions which were tried and tested, could um, be used. And that has been saved. So any provision, any request before that date is still going to be treated under the framework decisions. And that's set out there in Section 2 of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. So that at least provides certainty for the pre-decisions, the pre-requests. Um, what we then will see, if we can move to the next slide, is that, as we've mentioned, those will be using mutual recognition. This is the cornerstone of judicial cooperation, similar to extradition, similar to other EU um, models for cooperation, where it became recognition and a decision was made in a member state. And then because we were together in the um, a union, it would automatically be recognized. And there was um, very limited grounds which it could be objected to. It was, as put in Recital 8, purpose of the framework is to facilitate cooperation as regards mutual cooperation. That seems to be slightly putting it down. It wasn't necessarily facilitate, it was moving up to a step above just cooperation and it was a co um, it was more a, a rubber, st rubber stamp system is putting it, um, putting it probably too blasé. But it was having that close bond, recognizing that um, everybody in the member in the EU had similar jurisdictions, similar um, levels of legal um, foresight, and um, that because we were integrated, it was something that it, there could be that mutual recognition. How good that is, and how there is, especially with the differences in the EU how safe that was is now um, a matter is a matter for debate, but is more academic. We've now moved away from that position. If we go to the next slide. And we're now in, as we'll see, the new mutual cooperation. As I've mentioned, this um, in that under that system and system pre um, the withdrawal agreement pre the 31st of December 2020, the only challenges were statute barred, but only if criminal conduct occurred here, impossible because of immunity under domestic law, and incompatible with any convention rights. Often delay was potentially argued in those cases. I had a couple of that, but it was very unlikely, and I certainly didn't have an experience of any um, orders being successfully challenged. Interesting case of Moss 2019, where the regulations were read purpose, purposefully to facilitate enforcement, not to limit it. And that case law and that approach from the Court of Appeal is um, reflected in Dines as well, that in mutual co um, cooperation cases, in mutual reg recognition cases, it's, um, the courts are supposed to take a very positive approach to help cooperation. And the obvious reason for that is cooperation is vital in this area and vital in all areas because we live in an international world. So there's not supposed to be a nitpicking approach from um, lower courts or even higher courts, but there's supposed to be that positive approach, reading in a purpose, purpose um, approach, and that should facilitate enforcement. Indeed, my experience outside jurisdictions um, outside the EU, EU jurisdictions have been that a lot of mutual recognition sometimes comes a cropper because there's rather a limiting focus for courts, courts focus on limitations of mutual cooperation rather than um, how to um, purposefully interpret it.
and I won't name jurisdictions, but that has been an issue. And that's why I'm more concerned about a move to mutual cooperation. Hopefully, all member states will take a positive approach, an approach as we have in Moss. They're likely to, but there might be some blips. Next step, please. Sorry, slide, not step. Now, we have the back of the um, fag packet approach of the trade and cooperation agreement 2530 pages of interesting and delightfully drafted um, provisions now these provisions come in just after um, immediately after the last provisions we're talking about and from the 1st january onwards this will now govern our relationship going forward it's been implemented into law as set out in the European Union Future Relations Act 2020, Section 229. Next slide, please. So what does it do? It provides international cooperation for, as we talked about, investigations, freezing orders, enforcement confiscation, and enforcement of measures equivalent to confiscation of property in relation to criminal offences. So it replaces the framework decisions whole fully and it puts in a new system. How that system will be interpreted is something which we can make some very educated, I guess it, we can make some presumptions on, but it will be a very interesting and developments in the next 10 years, especially as different jurisdictions in Europe might have different approaches. It's very likely that we in the UK will take um, a very positive approach, as in Moss, as in Dines, but that might not be reflected in all jurisdictions, especially as you know, the UK has a markedly different um, asset recovery regime from most European jurisdictions, unlike when we're getting cooperation from ex-Commonwealth partners who, or sorry, Commonwealth partners who have usually closely aligned POCA provisions. Though when I say closely aligned, everybody has their unique POCA provisions. As somebody who rather enjoys reading different POCA provisions, each has their own unique ones and some very um, interesting novel and provisions inside, but I'll leave my favourite POCA lecture, POCA provision lecture to another day. Next slide, please. So, the objective is to provide cooperation to the widest extent possible. Article 656 makes this clear. I think that's exceedingly useful, and then that reflects Dines and Moss. This is what will be used to grease the wheels in cooperation moving forward. Clear departure from principle of mutual recognition. Yes, going to mutual cooperation. One of the effects of Brexit. And the words of the widest extent come directly from the Strasbourg Convention. And the Strasbourg Convention can be seen as a basis for a lot of what's gone on in the TCA in relation to this. The effect will likely be to allow domestic courts to refuse to recognise orders based on domestic legal provisions. So it's no longer a simple recognition. It can be looking at our own legal procedures, reflecting that, and then making a decision. Next slide, please. Article 665 provides that the state, which has received a request for the confiscation on property, shall enforce a confiscation order made by the court of the requesting state in relation to that property, or submit the request to its competent authority with a view to obtaining an order for confiscation and enforcing it. Article 663, at the request of another state, the request shall take the necessary provisional measures, i.e. freezing orders. So put in place the freezing orders and then wait for the confiscation order. Gone is a requirement for transmission of confiscation restraint order, rather it concentrates on the request itself. Next slide. So how can um, there be a, re a refusal to recognize another confiscation order? Here, as we see, there is much more wider grounds for refusal compared to under the framework decisions. You have double jeopardy, principle of dual criminality has to be considered, confiscation not permitted in domestic law for that type of offense could also be a very interesting one. 
and interest and ground for um, objection. Confiscation is contrary to domestic law in respect of the relationship between offence and economic advantage. So looking at benefit provisions, especially as some of our benefit provisions are much wider than those in certain European jurisdictions, that could be a problem abroad. How that's interpreted will be interesting. But then going back, as we've said, they need to be interpreted in the widest possible um, way. So that's why there is some room for manoeuvre, potentially. Not related to pre um, the fact that the order is not related to previous con uh, conviction or a decision of a judicial nature or a statement in such a decision that an offence or several offences have been committed. Six, lack of enforceability of the confiscation order or ongoing ordinary means of appeal in the requesting state. So is there appeal going on? Is it enforceable? Look, second from last, the request relates to a confiscation or resulting from a decision rendered in absentia. Interesting, given the use, as we see from um, extradition of in absentia convictions abroad, that might well come into play, especially as it's quite prevalent in a lot of jurisdictions. And then third party rights and how they might affect matters and enforceability. Next slide, please. Article 8 of the framework provided for many of these grounds, but there are more now many more grounds, there are more grounds for refu refusal. And there has to be a relationship between offence and economic advantage. Also, if it's not related to previous conviction, a decision of a judicial nature, and an offence, a several offences have been committed. Then, removal of mutual recognition means domestic law much more relevant, and how domestic law compares to other um, the jurisdiction requesting it. Criminal justice and data protection regulations have been repealed. They were very short for their time, as we've already mentioned. And then we go into how that will actually affect in the UK law. Move over to the next slide, please. So, Proceeds of Crime External Request Order, Order 2005-3181. You're all probably quite familiar with it. Uh, it's again, it's a mutual cooperation and Article 20, Subsection 1, the application to get, gives effect to what are those um, orders made in the Crown Court, and then there are the conditions of those effect. Now, what we have here is the way that we deal with and continue to deal with outside UK jurisdictions. If we can move to the next slide, I think that's useful. What we see is the issues here is that we've got Article 20 and Article 21 no clear grounds for refusal, but they set out the guideline, set out the framework. And that contrasts with the framework set out in the TCA. So do we end up with a two-stage process favoring recognition of non-EU state orders? It appears so. How that will develop and how the jurisdiction, how the case law will develop and the procedures will develop with TCAs, compare TCA requests under TCA compared to outside TCA requests will be interesting. Will they start to come together? I think the case law will still um, provide a background to that, especially with Dimes and Moss showing that there must be good faith acted, a good faith behind and quite a purposeful open approach. I think that still will be approached, but it will be interesting to see how it develops. Next slide, please. So here we have Dines. Interesting case. Well, I find it quite interesting. And it concerns an Italian pagamento. I apologise if I pronounced that wrong. A negotiated agreement for a parent in a criminal case. It was argued in the Court of Appeal that that should not be um, recognised under the 2005 order because it was, sorry, it was argued that it wouldn't, um, should not be regarded under Article 21 as a conviction under the external order. 
the Court of Appeal found no Italians see it as a conviction. Therefore, um, as they see it as that, this should be draft. This was dra this um, provision was drafted in the most open and internationalist approach. Therefore, as it's recognised, they recognise it. It should be recognised here. And they made it very clear that as following in Moss, Article 21.2 is to be taken as intending to promote international cooperation in the effect of enforcing confiscation orders. So what we have is that purposive approach coming through again, or we have is an open approach, and I wouldn't, and that open approach to be taken as moving and acting as a grease for mutual cooperation. I imagine that will continue, but the provisions now have some interesting aspects to them. They are, as we said, mutual cooperation, and there is much more, or sorry, not much more, but there are cl more clear grounds to challenge orders at this stage. Can I go to the next slide, please? So, summary of what I've said. Differences between the TCA and the 2000 order remain to be resolved. TCA largely replicates provisions of the Strasbourg Convention, an issue, a issue which I've hopefully covered. And external orders are not drafted to give effect to either the Strasbourg Convention or the TCA, as we've previously um, seen and Dines has commented on. There must be this international approach that will continue and the UK has drafted its legislation and also has advised its judges or to encourage internal corporate, international cooperation. So I think those are all the underlying factors which will encourage the TCA to be enforced and um, used in a positive light rather than a light which cuts down the amount of cooperation. I hope that has been useful and I hope matters are slightly clearer than mud after I've um, gone through them. I now hand over to Andrew and then Gary to take you through the civil-based um, asset recovery. Thank you very much, Barnaby. It's, it's, first of all, it's all new stuff. So we've all got to try and work out how it's going to happen. On the other hand, as you say, we're back to a few familiar friends like the external order um, back from 2005. My, my view is that um, the TCA isn't going to make a huge amount of difference compared with um, the way we've all treated non-EU uh, friends. So uh, Gary's going to be telling us a bit more about the conventions um, when, when he comes on. But uh, obviously we were dealing with the Council of Europe people. And one of the things I checked rather recently is to check that Belarus is not a member of the Council of Europe. And I'm glad to say it's not. So we don't have to do mutual cooperation with them. Um, but moving on now, so what Barnaby has been dealing with is the part two, so that's the criminal confiscation as we know it um, from the Proceeds of Crime Act. Gary has a bit of a challenge because the word confiscation in the international instruments also covers um, what we call forfeiture. Um, so that's the part five, civil recovery, summary forfeiture. And so we now have to completely change our hats from our criminal hats that Barnaby's been dealing with to our civil hats that Gary's about to deal with. So we've moved from part two POCA to part five POCA, and we're now looking at how the TCA, how the post-Brexit environment applies to mutual cooperation in civil proceedings. So over to Gary. Andrew, thank you very much. And good evening, everybody. As you've heard, what I'm going to deal with is international cooperation in part five proceedings, how the TCA has changed it, and some potential issues that have occurred to me and others in relation to how this may develop as time progresses. A quick overview as to what part five proceedings are, although I'm confident that most of you will be aware of that already. Uh, part five of POCA provides for non-conviction based forfeiture in proceedings that are civil in nature and where the enforcement authority that typically, if not exclusively, brings the proceedings has to prove uh, on the balance of probabilities that the property uh, was obtained or has been obtained through unlawful conduct. 
or was intended to be used in unlawful conduct. And you can see there on the slide the different types of civil uh, forfeiture proceedings pursuant to Part 5 that exist and are set out in the separate chapters uh, of Part 5 of the Proceeds of Crime Act. These are all proceedings that focus on property, uh, the property that is sought to be forfeited, or in the case of account forfeiture at orders, the shows in action. Uh, because, of course, uh, money that is contained in an account, it does not constitute property. They are typically, with that caveat, referred to as proceedings in REM. Can I have the next slide, please, Tess? Now, in relation to the kind of mutual legal assistance and international cooperation that is needed, the starting point, I would suggest, is, is how the domestic position is regulated. And for that, you need to look to Section 375A of the Proceeds of Crime Act, a provision that has been in effect from the 2nd of November of 2014, and it allows for requests for assistance in obtaining evidence from abroad in civil recovery proceedings. So focused on that essential step in many cases of how the enforcement authority obtains the evidence it needs from abroad. The request can either be made uh, by a judge, obviously on application to the judge, the judge considering it and then deciding whether to grant it, or by a senior appropriate officer. Now, dealing with the mechanics of the kind of MLA that may be needed, in high court civil recovery, it is conceivable that the asset be located abroad, and the precise provision there is Section 282A of the Proceeds of Crime Act. If that occurs, then plainly what will be needed is a recognition abroad of either or the property freezing order and potentially the civil recovery order. For cash, for listed assets, for account forfeiture orders, there's going to be no need to recognise the court order because they will all be focused on items of property or accounts that are based in the United Kingdom. But the, the request in, in those particular cases will be evidence-based. So either for evidence in relation to the underlying conduct, uh, evidence that allows a tracing exercise to take place, or evidence that allows for the rebuttal of the respondent's account. Uh, next slide, please, Tess. Uh, let me set out, if I can, at the previous position before the, the TCA came into effect, before Brexit. Uh, uh, the first is that the council framework decisions that, that Barnaby was talking about do not apply to non-conviction-based forfeiture. Instead, the international position was regulated by two U Council of Europe conventions. But the first is the Council of Europe Convention on Laundering, Search, Seizure uh, and Confiscation of the Proceeds to Crime, agreed at Strasbourg, in November of 1990, commonly referred to as the Strasbourg Convention. And the second is the Warsaw Convention, uh, agreed in Warsaw on the 16th of May of 2005. The Council of Europe is not to be confused with the Council of the European Union, typically referred to as the European Council. It is a separate uh, organisation unrelated to the EU. Uh, it's an international organisation based in Strasbourg, and, and it comprises 47 countries largely but not exclusively in Europe. It, it was set up, as you'll see, to promote democracy, human rights, and the rule of law in Europe, although given some of the signatories, uh, that might be a surprise. Uh, and please, by all means, have a look at some of those uh, signatories in your spare time. Uh, next slide, please, Hattes. Now, the, the point that Andrew raised here, a starting point, it is uh, at how those conventions deal with and define uh, particular items such as confiscation. Uh, and there's no way for me to deal with uh, this without uh, referring to the precise definition that's contained within the convention. So Article 1 of the Strasbourg Convention, Article 1 uh, D of the Warsaw Convention provides confiscation is a penalty or a measure ordered by a court following proceedings in relation to and I've underlined that and stressed that, uh, a criminal offence or criminal offences resulting in the final deprivation of property. That definition, as we will see, is copied word for word at Article 657A of the TCA. At Article 8 of the Strasbourg Convention it is the article that provides for um, it, it cooperation in relation to uh, investigative assistance. And Article 8 provides that the signatories 
uh, shall afford each other the widest possible measure of assistance in the identification and tracing of proceeds and other property liable to confiscation. That assistance includes providing and securing evidence as to the existence, location or nature of the property. And as we will see in a moment, that is almost Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> uh, both of these conventions have uh, helpful explanatory notes. Uh, paragraph uh, 15 of uh, the Strasbourg Convention uh, provides that there are both property-based uh, and value-based uh, confiscation systems across the signatory uh, states. So confiscation on a property basis, for example, Spain, value-based, obviously, the United Kingdom and Belgium. There are, however, considerable procedural differences. So some decisions are taken in civil proceedings that are distinct and separate from criminal proceedings. That includes Part 5 of POCA, but also there are similar systems in Italy, Ireland and Bulgaria. But these proceedings are referred to in the text of the Convention as proceedings for the purpose of confiscation and in the explanatory report as in rem proceedings. Next slide, please, Des. Uh, dealing with the explanatory notes to the Strasbourg Convention, paragraph 15 stresses that effective cooperation requires a recognition that although the systems are different, their purpose is the same. The Convention aims to treat the two systems of confiscation on an equal footing and as far as possible to make the text unambiguous in that respect. Paragraph 23 that relates to the definition of confiscation was drafted to make it clear that conventions deal with criminal activities or acts connected to criminal activities, such as acts related to civil in action. In other words, um, Article 8, which is the article that concerns the obligation to assist in relation to investigation, it, it is uh, plainly concerned with not just uh, confiscation, but acts connected therewith. And that's made clear in paragraph 36 that says that, that Article 8 should be interpreted in a broad manner since the committee refers to the widest possible measure of assistance. And to make the point clear, that assistance could relate to criminal proceedings, but it could also be for proceedings for the purpose of confiscation. And as you'll recall from the previous slide, that is their way of dealing with civil in rem part five type applications. Next slide, please, Tess. In relation to the Warsaw Convention, the, explan the explanatory notes make it plain that the purpose of this convention was to supplement and improve the Strasbourg Convention. Generally, in relation to mutual legal assistance and international letters of request, it's not as referred to as often as the Strasbourg Convention, that's because it's still only been ratified by 28 of the 47 countries. Paragraph 26 stresses the point of the, the Warsaw Convention and the need to improve the Strasbourg Convention, uh, really to take into account developments of new investigative techniques, to underline that investiga investigative techniques, because that's really at the very heart of why the Warsaw Convention was redrafted. At paragraph 39, the definition of confiscation is exactly the same. And so they make the point that the reason why they kept it the same is because they wanted it to be clear that the conventions deal with criminal activities or acts connected therewith, such as acts related to civil in rem actions. And they make the point at paragraph 40 that by using the word or whenever the word confiscation is used, it also includes, where applicable, forfeiture. So next slide, and let me summarise the conventions before we move on to the TCA. In my view, those notes, those explanatory notes, make the position as clear as possible. These conventions were drafted to include in rem, non-conviction based forfeiture. The purpose of the convention is to facilitate and not frustrate cooperation between the signatories as far as is possible. 
Uh, the conventions uh, plainly have been cited in part two cases, as Barnaby mentioned when he took us through the case of Dines. Uh, the conventions uh, have allowed for international cooperations between some states without difficulties for many years now. And the TCA did not need to alter that position. Uh, this, these conventions are completely independent from the EU. And so when the TCA was drafted, it had the choice as to whether or not it left those conventions entirely um, untouched by the new agreement. It decided not to do so, as we will see. But what it did do was base its structure and drafting on the conventions, replicating the provisions in many instances on a word-for-word -word basis. But the UK government um, has issued, and you can find it uh, on the internet in the UK government's website, a summary explainer of what the TCA means, or in other words, a summary explain explainer of what they think that they agreed and what they think that these um, TCA provisions mean. Uh, and what they think it means is that the TCA supplements, again, underline that, the relevant Council of Europe conventions, providing for more limited grounds for refusal. In other words, as far as mutual recognition is concerned, it's a step forward, uh, allowing recognition to occur uh, on a wider basis with less grounds of refusal than previously provided for in the conventions. One thing that uh, remains to be seen is whether the EU agree. Uh, from my dealings with them, uh, I understand that they don't necessarily. And then will the member, will the individual member states agree? That, of course, uh, remains to be seen. But further disagreement, it seems to me, is likely about the extent to which the TCA actually covers non-conviction-based forfeiture. Whilst it's clear that the conventions do, um, uh, are, uh, does the TCA and uh, are the explanatory notes to the conventions any assistance in interpretation of, of the provisions of the TCA? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, test. Uh, dealing with the precise provisions, then, if I may, of the TCA, uh, Article 656, subsection 6, provides as follow. In short, it provides that Title 11 of the TCA applies in place of the international cooperation chapters of the two conventions. Remember, it didn't need to do that, but it decided to do so. And so um, it plainly replaces and replaces the corresponding definition section of both conventions. Uh, now, what that means is that those conventions no longer regulate the position between the UK and the EU member states. But of course, they will regulate the position between the UK and other non-EU member states who are signatories to the Council of Europe Convention, Switzerland being an obvious example. It, it seems to me that replacing is not the same as supplementing. Uh, and once you decide to, to replace, if your intention is to supplement, then you need to make damn sure that your basis for doing so is clearly set out in the articles that you rely upon. Let me deal with Article 6, 5, sorry, 6, 6, 5, at uh, five and six on the next slide. That's how easy it is to become confused between these respective provisions. So th this is uh, Article 665, uh, and what it provides, dealing with this in short, is um, mutual cooperation to the widest extent possible uh, under domestic law with a state requesting the execution of measures equivalent to confiscation of property. Where the, where the request has not been issued in the framework of proceedings in criminal, in criminal matters, um, as long as uh, a, a court is involved. And the measures in, in subsection 6 specifically referred uh, to are seizure, detention and forfeiture of property and assets by means of application to civil courts. That is exactly the same, or almost exactly the same, as Article 23, uh, Paragraph 5 of the Warsaw Convention which also uses the words executions of measures equivalent to confiscation, leading to the deprivation of property, which are not criminal sanctions. The explanatory notes to the Warsaw Convention set out that the entire purpose of this provision was to ensure that in respect of execution of these measures, um, cooperation to the widest extent possible is provided for 
in the body of the text of the treaty rather than merely in the explanatory notes. So what it seems to be uh, is that by replicating this provision within the TCA, uh, the TCA now plainly allows for recognition of part five orders, such as a property freezing order or a civil recovery order. The question is whether it does so for information or evidence. Plainly, this provision doesn't allow that. Next slide, uh, please, Tess. So in order to consider that question that I've just posed, the first stop is the objective provisions within Title 11, and they're set out in Article 656. The first one, 6561, uh, provides a co cooperation between the UK and member states to the widest extent possible in respect of these particular uh, elements. The first, investigations and proceedings aimed at freezing of property with a, subsequent, with a view to subsequent confiscation thereof, and investigation and proceedings aimed at the confiscation of property, but both of those are within the framework of proceedings in criminal matters. And then it specifically says that this does not preclude other cooperation, but appears to limit that other cooperation to the type of cooperation mentioned in, in Article 665, 5 and 6, which is what I've just gone through. So does that allow for cooperation in relation to investigation in part five cases? Next slide, please. Now that uh, 656 subparagraph one provision it is completely new. It, it's a TCA standalone provision that has no corresponding provisions in either the Strasbourg or the Warsaw Convention. The closest is Article 15 of the Warsaw Convention that simply allows for mutual cooperation to the widest extent possible, but doesn't uh, refer or limit Article 5 cooperation, Article 15 cooperation, uh, to Article 23.5. So what you appear to have here is within the TCA uh, an attempt, whether knowingly, whether expressly, whether implicitly, to limit mutual legal assistance in part five cases to execution of measures equivalent to confiscation of property. In other words, the orders, whether it's a property-based freezing order or, or whether it's a civil recovery order. Uh, that's not the only type of assistance that's, complement that, that's contemplated within the TCA, because as you'll see in Article 656, subparagraph 2, it's plain that the type of assistance that is contemplated includes investigative assistance and provisional measures with a view to either form of confiscation. So confiscation is the term that they have used, and they've done so in reference to the two types value-based and property-based that are set out there in 656, subsection 2A. Those proceedings again, or those, that provision there, identical terms, the corresponding provisions in both Strasbourg and Warsaw. Where does that leave us? Next slide, please. Article 657 is the definition uh, part of Title 11, uh, and they have a definition for property, which includes property of any description which the state considers to be, and there is a, a three Roman numeral subpart to this, the property appears to be limited to a property which the requesting state considers to be the proceeds of a criminal offence or its equivalent, and then this, uh, Roman numeral three, property that is subject to confiscation under any other provisions relating to powers of confiscation under the law of the requesting state following proceedings in relation to a criminal offence, including third-party confiscation, extended confiscation, and confiscation without final conviction. I've got to say that I'm not entirely sure what they mean by confiscation without final conviction, particularly when it appears to be linked to proceedings in relation to a criminal offence. It seems to me that that could uh, uh, well include part five proceedings, but it also may not. It, it's up for debate, and it's one of the things that the DCA, in my view, has left unclear. This provision 657, in my view, is, an, is a strange provision because rather than confining itself to the definition of property, it goes on to qualify what counts as property and, and qualifies it in a way that suggests that the circumstances in which a request for confiscation of property may arise are limited, although it doesn't expressly say so. So a, a strange definition section and something that will need to be considered as time goes on. Article 658 is the precise provision that provides for investigative assistance. 
And it says the states shall afford each other the widest possible measure of assistance in identification and tracing of, proceed, of proceeds and other property liable to confiscation. This is the same, or almost exactly the same as Article 8 of the Strasbourg Convention, which also used the term property liable to confiscation. And that, it seems to me, by adopting those words and indeed by almost lifting wholesale Article 8 and um, placing it in Article 658 with only a, a descriptive difference that, in my view, is largely immaterial, uh, does, does or did the authors, the draftsmen of the TCA, uh, intend by doing so to adopt the definition given to Article 8 within the explanatory notes? Uh, uh, in other words, uh, that assistance uh, could relate to criminal proceedings, but it could also be proceedings for the purpose of confiscation, which are related to criminal activity. Uh, next slide, please. So, so let, let me summarise uh, as I come to a conclusion, the obligation to assist. It, it seems, as I've just outlined, that there is a plain tension between Article 656.1, the freestanding provision in the TCA, that a plea, a, appears to limit uh, international cooperation to, in part five cases, recognition of orders and the definition of obligation to assist which replicates the convention uses the term confiscation which is defined as i've said in the tca in exactly the same way as it is in the convention and although it's abundantly clear to me at least that the eu and the uk have completely different opinions about whether or not the tca allows for um, an obligation to assist in investigative uh, cases in part five uh, circumstances. I, I, in my view, there are three reasons, three good reasons, uh, why, the, why going forward the TCA should be interpreted in a manner that would allow for investigative assistance. And you have them set out there in the slide. The first is this. For, for me, uh, in many ways, when it comes to adopting the definition of confiscation, when it comes to uh, adopting Article 8 in its precise terms uh, within Article uh, 657, when it comes to uh, uh, copying Article 23.5 of the Warsaw Convention, uh, it, it, my view is that when you copy um, such a provision and there exists explanatory notes to both conventions, that set out in very clear terms what the meanings of those provisions are, by copying them, you are adopting the meaning that is given to them. If you like, uh, uh, putting it simply, uh, those provisions contain definitions that are a work of art uh, uh, or a term of art, and, and they are to be taken as so when you adopt them. Secondly, uh, uh, as Barnaby's set out, the, the international approach in Dines an approach typically favoured by UK courts it is designed to facilitate rather than frustrate cooperation and really to pose the rhetorical question, what exactly would be the purpose to be achieved by frustrating international cooperation in respect of investigation? Surely the purpose of investigation is to obtain the best evidence and surely the best evidence is what any court requires in order to accurately and properly determine the outcome of any case. So let me summarise with the final slide, if I may, drawing this part of the webinar to a close. But that issue that I've highlighted it is, in my view, one issue that exists, the practical problems within the TCA, the lack of explanatory notes setting out what each party agreed or, and what the provisions mean um, it is, of course, understandable in the historic context of the TCA, but extremely unhelpful when it comes to interpretation and plainly allows for each party uh, to adopt a different approach and understanding to what the text says. Uh, the TCA, of course, didn't involve the individual member states who are likely to take their own approach, which may well differ between the two states. Uh, and so it means that the degree of mutual legal assistance will vary from state to state, as indeed it always has. In short, it seems to me that the TCA raises more issues than it answers. 
Uh, and perhaps that isn't surprising given the, the nature and the circumstances by which it was drafted. Uh, so that's uh, all that I, I think, can usefully say in relation to uh, international cooperation in part five cases. And I'll hand the webinar back to Andrew, if I may. Um, well, thank you very much, Gary. I think if we just sort of pause a moment and say to ourselves, right, let's imagine we've got uh, a civil recovery um, investigation or, or um, perhaps a frozen funds investigation, and we want to do some, uh, get some evidence from abroad using international cooperation as it now is. And if we want to go, let's just say we want some evidence from Germany, and we want some evidence from a non-EU member, but someone who's a member of the Council of Europe. Um, I won't suggest Azerbaijan or Russia for the moment, but there are plenty of others. Um, let's find a nice, nice country that's not, not, not in the EU, but is in Council of Europe. We're going to be using the conventions in relation to the Council of Europe country, and we're going to be using the TCA in relation to the EU member. So if there is a difference, uh, if the cut and paste operation, cutting and pasting from two conventions 15 years apart onto one very long back of an envelope hasn't worked, um, then perhaps that might demonstrate itself. But it's, uh, I think we can safely say that uh, we are living in a changing world and we're going to see some interesting developments. Equally, of course, the efficacy or not of an international letter of request has always been for some countries anyway, a, a matter of um, perhaps not necessarily the most reliable um, way of getting evidence before the English court, but there we are. I suspect that one thing we will definitely find is that for the state, it's going to appear that it's going to be more difficult than for private clients on the defence side who can go and make their own inquiries in the foreign state quite unbeleaguered by the need, A, to select the right convention, B, to work out whether or not the proceeds, proceedings you're in are confiscation or not, and C, having to worry about whether you're talking about property. Um, but we will just have to wait and see. Um, as always, experience shows that, unfortunately, um, perhaps, or fortunately, depending on what side you are, the straightforward approach of the private sector ringing up a lawyer in the foreign state and asking him to do a company's house search for them is going to be a lot more efficient than using, for example, um, one or other of these conventions to get your company's house search. There we are. Um, well, there is now a little bit of time for questions. Um, earlier on, um, I was looked at the chat. Thank you very much to, to John for his his comment, which no doubt everyone's seen because it's oh, it's to, no, it was to all panelists. But um, John Mack from the SFO help, helpfully told us a, 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 about a, 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 the case of Alstom, where a patagiamento was considered as to whether or not it was to be a, a conviction um, and some other interesting stuff. Um, I don't know, John, whether you want, intended that to go to everyone, but um, you, could, you could probably send it to everyone as well if you want. Um, I, I think when I said, said to everyone, please use the chat if you have any questions, I'll try to coordinate them. I got absolutely no questions at all. Um, so that's very, very good. One thing, of course, you would will realise when Barnaby put in his little drop for Millington and Sutherland Williams, of which he's one of the sub-editors, uh, there are, of course, also available Mitchell, Taylor and Talbot, of which Gary is one of the sub-editors, and Smith, Owen and Bodnar, of which I'm one of the sub-editors. So between the three of us, you've got all three textbooks. Um, I expect it will be a race to get up to date with the uh, first of these decisions. Right, we have a question. Um, so here's the question. In our view, in a criminal case, can a request for freezing of property be refused on grounds which are not mentioned in Title 11, which requesting states are not required to address in the prescribed form and which might not be a criteria at all in some jurisdictions, such as risk of dissipation? Right. Well, let's, should we try and, I'm going to put some, try, try and put some, I'm going to ask Barnaby to answer this, um, but I'm going to try and put some theoretical facts on this. So let's say we have an incoming request from Ruritania, which says, please, can you provide us um, with assistance because we're prosecuting someone in Ruritania for the offence of uh, woozling. Um, and when they put in their form, there are some objections that there may be and some objections that, that there may not be. 
And the example that Max has given us is some, um, well, risk of dissipation. So they say that uh, we want to restrain the proceeds of, that he's put in England. Let's say he's bought a property in England, which they say is um, the proceeds of weaseling in Ruritania. They put in a request to us to recognize, or not recognize, to provide mutual cooperation um, in relation to their restraint order. Um, Barnaby, can you, can you help us with that? Now that I've waffled enough to give you time to read the question. Thank you very much. And your waffling was very greatly appreciated. The answer I think is yes, it could be, probably it probably won't actually happen. The being that looking at dimes and looking at this general overall appreciation of wanting to have cooperation and a focus on making it more purpose based, I'd imagine that the courts are going to take it in a wider aspect. Now, dissipation could be under potential you could be looking at whether there's a need for the order. I think there could be some interpretation that fits grounds of refusal potentially and more taking the grounds and being quite imaginative to use them as a reason to stop it. That's where it could be refused, but I think generally most courts are on notice after Dimes and Cro Moss that they should be looking into more purpose purpose-based support approach and we will that we will probably see but I'd imagine that a case like that would swiftly go to the Court of Appeal for them to make an example of um, it but the answer um, we'll go back to is let us see. I, I suppose the point is that because it's a TCA case the requesting state is necessarily an EU member that's the first point. Yep. So my, my, I'm a bit unfair calling it Ruritania. So th this is this is a friendly EU member state, which is likely to have fairly similar criteria to us. But of course, it is quite conceivable they will have different ones. That that's the yes, but especially with some of the Eastern European countries, they have quite novel approaches to this. Not novel approaches. Sorry, that seems to be disparaging. But there is a slight different approach there. So we do take it on red that after the mutual recognition that um, phase, well, after we did have mutual recognition that they would be very similar. I think there is going to be a, a more stronger looking at different provisions, but my reading of um, the Court of Appeal approach is give them a bit of a leeway. Let's just see if they've made an order we should be looking at um, approaching it with goodwill and cooperation. And, as, as, and especially as we all, there have been periods where that goodwill and cooperation hasn't been there, especially with turning round orders in time. And we know that once that breaks down, both sides suffer later on. So I think you'll, that might be more of a policy objective, but I think that will be something which is taken into consideration. Right, well... Thank you very much for, for a, a, a great extemporary response to that very tricky question. Um, no, there are no more questions from the panelists. Um, I'm just going to touch on one little topic, which is which is connected with the TCA, but isn't necessarily connected with mutual cooperation. It's it's something that actually I think has floated. Everyone's been happily ignoring it because during the during the pandemic, we've all got very used to everyone giving evidence by video link of one kind or another, and. Um, what has been raised in two cases I've done recently, both in um, uh, account, well, one was a cash forfeiture, one was an account freezing order and forfeiture case, is we've all been happily assuming that you can have video ev evidence given by anyone wherever they are. Um, so it's all, uh, I, for example, had a case, it was an open court case, there's nothing to hide about it, um, account freeze, account forfeiture case, where there was an English expert witness who happened to be in Germany and he was stuck in Germany, he couldn't get back. So he gave his evidence, expert evidence witness by, by evidence by video link from Germany. Now, no one had even thought that anyone needed permission from the German state for a witness to give evidence in civil proceedings in the Westminster Magistrates Court. Certainly, um, some uh, my very distinguished uh, opponent, um, one of the three within Mitchell, Mitchell uh, Taylor and Talbot, and you can probably guess which one, um, didn't, didn't ask for permission. I didn't object. 
Uh, and actually, I cross-examined his expert for the best part of a day, and none of us thought that, that there might be any breach of international comity. Uh, since then, there has been a little rather short practice direction from the Chancery Division, Lord Justice Flo, which has said, hang on, everyone, can we just stand back and think about it? Um, uh, we've all been quite happily assuming it doesn't matter where this video witness is, but if they're in a foreign state which doesn't permit or which only permits evidence to be given in English courts with the permission of the foreign state, there might we might be trespassing on some uh, judicial toes or extra uh, foreign judicial toes. Um, I just wondered if uh, Gary and Barnaby wanted to contribute anything to that. I've, I've seen the, we've probably all seen, well, no, uh, John Mack has only replied to the panelists. John Mack just said, yikes, um, which, uh, so it's a surprise to the SFO, but uh, let's um, let's see, Gary or Barnaby, any, any views that you've got? I mean, I've had one district judge saying, um, so I'll give you the other example. The other example was in Folkestone Magistrates Court where my opponent in the cash forfeiture in person was in Poland because he's a Polish lorry driver who was carrying a large amount of cash in his lorry. And he wanted to attend the forfeiture hearing by video link so he could be there and he wasn't allowed into the UK to oppose it in person because we wouldn't let him in and would make him quarantine. We said absolutely fine, no problem. He said absolutely fine, no problem. And then the district judge says, no, you need the permission of the Polish authorities for this guy to, to give evidence in my court. I mean, I must say that we treat as a complete googly, but uh, the district judge was adamant and said, said that's what we always do in Folkestone. I said, well, that's not what they do in Westminster. So we immediately uh, got, got, got into a, a little dis uh, uh, row there, um, a very well, well intentioned row, but the event, in the event, um, clearly the guy had to be heard. Um, so we had to adjourn to get, wait till he's, it's safe for him to come from Poland. Um, so George Zachary has, has said the Hague Convention would apply, but Gary or Barnaby, what do you think? I'll have a go. My instinctive reaction would have been that the convention applies. But, um, I mean, one of the things that I was able to do while you were asking the question is very briefly research this. And, of course, Germany is plainly a convention, a signatory to the Hague Convention of Taking Evidence. And yet, in a, in a recent civil case, 2021, interdigital technology cooperation versus Lenovo, the patent case in the High Court. That's a case that involved a German expert, um, sorry, an, an expert British citizen who was in Germany and who was going to give evidence by video link because of COVID. And it emerged that the German courts treated um, that as uh, at something that breached German law because of an issue of sovereignty. Uh, and they took the view that, as a matter of German law, the German courts needed to give permission. And what the judge found in that case is that, that there was a real risk of breaching German law if the court were to give permission. Um, uh, that, that's something I think that's that degree of caution, which is what comes from your question, Andrew, it is also specifically set out in Annex 3 of the practice direction to CPR 32. So a little bit of research, no real answer, um, but I think it's caution and potentially, in some instances, you may need the permission of uh, the local court or the judicial authority for the particular country. If I can just agree with Gary as well, I have experience of this sitting as a judge in immigration, where it's become a hot topic as well. I think, it, I think because, especially in civil, recover, um, civil recovery based areas, it is going to be something which has to be taken into account. And I think we have got a bit blasé about it. Um, we'll see what effect of it is. I'm slightly surprised by the Polish decision, as I thought they would be covered if memory serves but i haven't checked that but folkestone has already always had a very distinct jurisdiction from the uk england wales and any other country so that doesn't surprise me i, I think i think with immigration uh, this may be why we get the westminster model because at westminster obviously um uh, it's it doing a lot of extradition cases where of course the foreign state is a party one way or the other albeit represented by the cps usually to the proceedings so i suspect they're very familiar 
with it in extradition. And I suspect in immigration cases, it's where, where, where for example, you're, you're, you're going to be dealing with similar matters, such as you know, human rights abuses in the foreign country. I, I suspect that, that, that the foreign state is, is maybe assumed that the foreign state will permit, permit it. Um, if that, actually, no, it's, it's only if they're on a certain list and they've given previous permission in immigration. I think, the diff I think one of the things with extradition is it's criminal based rather than civil based. And I think that might be um, an issue that comes up. Immigration, we in essence were told, whoa, you're taking far too much evidence from abroad. Here's, here's the list, look at it. I've had Ivory Coast giving special permission for people. So I, th I think, yeah, it, it's, it's going to be interesting how it develops. Yeah, well, anyway, it's, a, it's, a, it's not really a topic for this uh, discussion, but I think, it, I think it's a real immediate practical importance um, to, mm. to, for uh, courts to sort this out and, and for people to decide what, what's going to happen or not. Um, we've had one more question. I think we better have this the last question because we're all probably getting very thirsty. Um, and sadly, we can't say we've got pizzas waiting for us upstairs. Um, we'll have to wait till uh, September or October when we can get back to normal. But Helen Hughes has, um, has sent a question. Um, under mutual recognition, so that's the old regime, we registered EU orders for freezing or restraint that were headed unknown suspect, where, for example, funds have been transferred by fraud to a UK bank, but the account holder or perpetrator was not known. If an order uh, for the restraint of an unknown suspect over a bank account is sent now, do you think that the UK court would permit the application? I can answer that, Andrew. Good. Are you going to answer, answer that? Right? Yeah, the, the, the answer is no. It's Article 7 of the External Orders Order. Article 7, subsection 2C sets out that the first condition is that the Crown Court needs to be satisfied. That there are reasonable grounds to suspect that the alleged offender named in the request uh, has benefited from his criminal conduct. So that would seem to suggest no. Which, which is interesting because, of course, you could, in theory, so long as you've got a defendant, in a purely domestic case, you can have a restraint order against an account in which the defendant has an interest, but he doesn't, of course, have to be the, be, be the nominated, he doesn't have to be the account holder. And, and so you, and, and very often restraint orders are made. So again, so long as you've got a named defendant against property, all property in, in whosoever's name, but I suppose the key point to hear is a restraint order is an in personam order in English domestic law. So you do need someone, someone with a persona against whom to enforce it. Um, right. OK, well, uh, I'm very impressed that Gary had the immediate answer to that. And he's obviously been looking at the back of too many envelopes. Um, I think what I'd like to do is, 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 is wrap things up. But I must say, I, for one, are really looking forward to when we can have a real drink afterwards. Um, well, not on our own um, or with our dog or family <laughs> um, and, uh, and uh, commune. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining in. I really hope, actually, much as these webinars have great advantages, I really would rather like to uh, get back to the pre-existing position. And I don't mean by that mutual recognition. I mean by that a beer and a pizza afterwards and actually chatting to you all. But great to see you all. Um, thank you very much. There is a, another seminar that is being plotted by me, Barnaby and Tess, um, with our old friend Aidan uh, Larking and his new outfit to do with um, recovery of assets, um, and in particular recovery of crypto assets. So I think the, the installment three, we haven't quite worked out the total, uh, the exact um, title yet, but we're going to be dealing with international recovery of assets and Aidan's going to be sharing his experience and, and great expertise in uh, securing bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies from unwilling and recalcitrant targets. So I think that will have a very interesting practical aspect and um, it won't be all pure law and it won't be all discussing on how much there is on the back of Boris's envelope. So once again, thank you very much to everyone for joining in. Thank you for Gary and Barnaby for doing all the hard work in this um, and letting me just do, do, do the uh, continuity announce a bit. And thanks to Tess for organizing all the technology.